Is it me or does it really feel like the last few episodes have been a bit of a downer? Don't blame me of course, for the Metroid series took quite a bit of a downturn for a while. Once the Prime series had completed and Retro Studios moved on to other things, it just felt like the Metroid franchise was beginning to hibernate and take a bit of a backseat. It felt like a repeat of the N64 days as fans clambered for a new entry that Nintendo just wasn't going to give them. Ironically, the same was rather true of a similar series, Castlevania. Whilst finding itself a wonderful little niche on handhelds like the GBA and Nintendo DS, this particular series was also finding itself to be in a bit of a funk. But in a parallel to Metroid, Retro Studios and the Prime Trilogy, once again a Japanese publisher looked to foreign shores to revitalise the Belmont's fortunes. A mostly unknown studio named Mercury Steam, with some input from Kojima Productions, was charged by Konami to reboot Castlevania for a new generation. Lords of Shadow was a game I was rather fond of at the time, and definitely put this developer on my list of studios to watch out for as the game received glowing reviews upon its 2010 release. With that game's post credit sequence providing a shockingly good twist, I certainly wanted more. In 2013, the studio would follow this up with Mirror of Fate on the Nintendo 3DS and later on home consoles in a HD version, a side-scrolling adventure not unlike the Metroid series, adopting the Metroidvania mechanics that had been a part of Castlevania since Symphony of the Night. Lords of Shadow 2 would appear in 2014 to mixed reviews, with the game failing to match the original reboot, and after this setback, Castlevania would once again disappear into the shadows following this failure and just don't mention Pachinko. However, following a studio visit by Metroid co-creator Yoshio Sakamoto, Mercury Steam would be given the keys to another fallen franchise, Metroid. Mercury Steam had expressed a desire to remake Metroid Fusion, but Sakamoto had a better idea. Instead, remake the Game Boy's Metroid 2, Return of Samus. An incredibly important game to Metroid's overarching narrative, but one that was limited by the system it resided on. Jointly developed between Mercury Steam and Nintendo's own EPD studio, Samus Returns release in 2016 was the first 2D game in the series since 2004's Zero Mission. What we have here is a title that casts away the shackles of a sprite-based 8-bit game displaying on an 160x144 pixel display to a more modern 2D game with 3D models. Additionally, the game also makes use of the 3DS's stereoscopic display to create some real depth with the more detailed backgrounds. As a remake, it's unrecognisable, yet the original game is kind of there underneath. The narrative is the same. Samus is tasked with ridding the Metroids from existence by raiding their home planet of SR388. As for Return of Samus's more linear area-based structure, that too is retained. However, whilst the majority of Metroid 2's pickups could originally be mocked up the first time you're in the area, Samus returns as the exploration that was sorely missing from the original version. Additionally, the planet is littered with teleport stations that, when discovered, can be used to make backtracking a much less laborious process. Yet it is how Samus controls that is possibly the biggest triumph of this remake. No longer limited to basic cardinal aiming directions, the player is now able to aim with full analogue precision. In fact, they can now free aim by holding the L button and rotating the analogue stick. Additionally, in a first for the series, a melee attack has been added linked to the game's new counter-attack system. When enemies attack, they quickly flash, at which point the player can use a timed press of X to counter, usually stunning the attacking enemy. It's a pretty fun mechanic, and while some may feel like this addition slows down the combat slightly, I find that by the time you start to tire of this new function, you start to find more powerful weaponry, and the need to melee most enemies dissipates. And once you do start to get all of those awesome weapons and upgrades, that feeling of running through levels like a badass, blasting enemies and jumping over hazards, that feeling that's been missing from Metroid for so long begins to come back. And there's a fluidity to the game that other M tried and failed to implement, and it feels wonderful. The teams behind this game clearly know what makes Metroid work and they pulled out all the stops to make this remake something that will please anyone that's ever played and enjoyed a 2D entry. Even if you know Metroid 2 like the back of your hand, Samus Returns does what a remake should do and changes things up. 
SR388 might well retain its segmented nature, but the environments have been completely redesigned to have a greater level of depth, especially as the returning and all new weapons and equipment allow for all new ways to explore. Another huge new feature is Aeon abilities that whittle down the new Aeon bar that is replenished by defeating enemies, especially when you encounter melee them. These four tools are selected using the D-pad and are used to help Samus on her journey to the depths of SR388. First up is the Scan Pulse, essentially a portable map station that can be used to reveal a gigantic chunk of the map, including the location of any collectibles, plus it will reveal destructible blocks in the nearby area. Such an ability is a great inclusion for people that won't want to have to shoot or morph ball bomb every single block to find their way through like prior Metroid games, but for those who prefer the old ways, they can simply not use it. It's the best of both worlds. Next up is Lightning Armor, an ability that protects Samus from harm, but any damage received will deplete the Aeon Bar instead, really useful for fighting tough enemies or even to get through damaging environmental hazards. The Beam Burst adds a machine gun burst shot to Samus' arsenal, increasing attack power and also allowing the player to tackle more resilient enemies that are otherwise unharmed by standard beam shots. Finally, the Phase Drift slows down time for everyone but Samus. If you ever find yourself in a new bridge situation with blocks that crumble when you step on them, activate this ability and you'll be able to walk past them before they can disintegrate. The majority of weapons and suits from the original game return, but unlike Metroid 2, beam upgrades now stack like in Super Metroid instead of being replaced. The grapple beam from Super Metroid also makes a wonderful comeback and as well as its uses for traversing large gaps, it is also used for breaking or moving blocks that are blocking progress. It also has plenty of offensive uses too, to look out for red glowing areas that can be grappled. These new abilities and refinements add some real depth to the Metroid formula and are also of great use to less capable players. In fact, because of the many quality of life upgrades this game has received, I think this game might be the ideal title to introduce new players to the Metroid series. The difficulty is challenging in places, but thanks to generous checkpoints and save stations, death never feels like too much or too little of a punishment. This is good because there's a couple of bosses around, including some new to this remake, that will definitely catch you off your guard. However, with so many tools and abilities at her disposal, and only so many buttons available, Samus Returns does rely on the touchscreen to switch between beam and missile types. Most of the time in quieter areas, it's not so much of a problem, but I did find lots of occasions where I'd be in the thick of the action, especially during boss fights, and stumble to switch between weapons without being damaged. As the melee attack and Aeon abilities both take up the use of a button each as well as the D-pad, they could probably have been of a better use of the control scheme. It's not a massive issue, just a small annoyance. However, the touchscreen really comes into its own with the map. In its default display, you'll see a nice easy to read map on the bottom of the screen, which is always useful in a game like this. However, it is also possible to add your own markers to this map with a useful function that lets you drag a limited number of coloured pins to make a note of areas of interest for later exploration. It's a feature that this series has been calling out for for years, and it's great to see it's finally here and so incredibly useful. It's a tricky balance to figure out how much you can really change in the original game before it no longer ends up as a remake. Samus Returns admirably straddles that line reasonably well, even if some of those carried over elements create their own problems that can't quite be resolved by removing them. This title is mostly locked onto the conventions of the original game, including the multiple Metroids that need to be defeated in order to explore the planet further. As a result, there are a lot of instances of fighting the same enemies over and over again, and while there are some new additions to the rogues gallery, there's also a lot of recolored enemies that are slightly tougher than those you defeated before. That's not to say that fighting Metroids isn't always the same experience, as the various different species from the original Metroid 2 return, but have now become fully fledged boss fights, with new attack patterns and weak points, including times where you can even melee counter them. There's a lot of fun to be had in figuring out the most efficient way to defeat these creatures, although once you've kind of worked that out, it can be a little frustrating to battle the same Metroids over and over again. Some of these nasties will even run away when damaged enough, meaning you've then got to go and find them again before you can finish them off, which is quite annoying at times. 
The soundtrack does a great job for the most part in bringing these atmospheric 8-bit noises to modern standards. The returning tracks from the original game have been given a superb treatment and are much more pleasant to the ears now. However, this is another Metroid game that reuses the same few tracks from Super Metroid, which probably wouldn't be a problem if it weren't for the fact that I've played every Metroid game over the course of the last 6 months and I'm getting a little fed up with the same Super Metroid tracks in most of them. Granted, they're still great tracks, but I would appreciate a little originality or at least some tracks taken from other games in the series. Visually, Samus Returns does the series justice, a wonderful thing to see after playing Federation Force. The 3D models look brilliant when compared to the original manual artwork, let alone the original game sprites. Samus herself looks brilliant in all of her suits, and she's animated incredibly well, with a femininity to her movements that's not really been implemented previously. Enemies also look great, despite the palette swapping, while the bigger beasts are really intimidating. It's also quite a colourful game, with all sorts of purples, oranges and greens, a real treat to the eyes after playing a lot of brown and grey Metroid games of the 2000s. A possible bone of contention for some might well be the game's amiibo support. Samus Returns has some support for four specific figures, the Samus and Zero Suit Samus amiibo from the Super Smash Bros line, and two figures released specifically for this game. Samus in her Metroid 2 box art pose and an awesome looking baby Metroid in a broken canister. These figures will not only unlock some concept art once the player has completed the game, but will also provide some useful additions that cannot be unlocked any other way. The baby Metroid can be used every day to show the player where the nearest Metroid can be found, while the other three figures would unlock reserve tanks for energy, missiles and Aeon energy. These tanks cannot be found without these amiibo figures, which might feel a bit like overly expensive DLC to some. Personally, the game can be enjoyed without ever needing any of the items provided by amiibo, and if you're already collecting these figures anyway, because they're cool little items in their own right, they're a nice little bonus. Additionally, the Metroid amiibo can also unlock an extra hard fusion mode where enemies deal four times the damage. This is in addition to the standard hard mode that is unlocked by finishing the game once. As for other unlockables, the game does give you a slightly different result screen on completion depending on how quickly you finish the game, as well as what difficulty modes you played. But if you also reach certain item completions in each area of the game, you will also unlock Chozo Memories, beautiful pieces of artwork that reveal a little more insight into what happened to the Chozo on SR388 and why the Metroids have been trapped in these caverns. It's a nice little bonus to keep you playing, but you can always see these images online if you don't quite have the patience. Unlike the original game, you won't find all of the items on your first run of each area. On the contrary, some items require you to backtrack once you discover the baby Metroid right at the end of the game before you escape to your ship to leave SR388. I did a respectable run of the game in under 8 hours, not concentrating on getting all the items, just the ones I could easily grab on my travels, but even though I didn't need all of those items, I enjoyed replaying Samus Returns again to the stage that I actually might come back to this one and get everything once I've finished this video series. It's an enjoyable reminder of what the Metroid series can be, and further proof that the series can still work in a 2D playing space. The Aeon abilities, especially the Scan Pulse, makes for a more accessible exploration without feeling like a grind. The melee counter makes combat feel fresh and new, whilst the whole game plays so fluidly that I was grinning from ear to ear. Admittedly, much of what I didn't like so much about Samus Returns were elements carried over from the original Return of Samus, such as the overall game structure of hunting a certain number of Metroids before being able to explore further, and the repeating enemies. It's a real shame that this game hasn't found its way onto the Switch yet, because it will be great to see it get another outing for those that might have missed out. This is to Metroid 2 what Zero Mission was to the original Metroid. With the existence of Samus Returns, there is little reason to go back to Metroid 2 as much as I quite like that game. This is absolutely how to remake a game, even more so than Zero Mission. And while the world waited years for a sniff of Metroid Prime 4, with nothing but a 42 second teaser of its logo since its announcement in 2017, Nintendo were quietly working on something else, and so was Mercury Steam. After 15 videos, it all comes down to this. We have reached the end of this road, this journey, and that means one thing. 
Next week, I'll be reviewing Metroid Dread. After playing, completing and reviewing every single official Metroid release, I'll be giving my final judgement on Samus' latest adventure. Do not miss it.